Hi everyone. I'm so happy to be making this video for all of you guys. So it's been a while since I've produced a new video. A lot has happened in my life. Uh, most notably, my wife and I had a daughter about 10 months ago, which might explain the lack of YouTube videos over the last little while. And I've also been very busy on clinics and taking care of my best friend, Mr. Pirate here, who's just having a little drink off screen. And I'm super happy to be making this video because a year ago, I made a video that was very hard for me to make. It was Mr. Pirate Health Update, talking about the health issues that my little friend is experiencing um, as he is getting older, and some of them precipitated by a crisis. And I'm very pleased to be making this update video a year down the road with this little guy looking great and chubby and glossy and doing really, really well, although it did take quite a bit of work to get him here. I'm super, super excited to be making this because not only was this gonna be a little health update for all of you who are very concerned about how Mr. Pirate is doing, but it's also gonna be an illustration of how you can take care of an older cat if cost and time and effort is simply not a limitation. Another title for this video could be, how to take care of an older cat optimally. But before we get into it, please remember to squish that subscribe button and pet the bell notification icon so you can get notified of all my new videos. And if you appreciate the work that I'm doing, I would really appreciate your support on Patreon because my Patreon subscribers really help me get motivated and get equipment and editing stuff and justify time off clinics to do this kind of educational outreach work. Because I promise you, by the time you're watching this video, you will have a much better idea of how to take care of the older cat or dog, or really any other kind of pet in your life, at least in general concept. Now, I've made a number of other videos on the topic of geriatric cat care. Taking care of older cats has been a huge passion of mine throughout my career. So I'll be referencing a lot of the other videos I made on my channel, and I'll try to throw links to all of them in the description below. But if I miss one, just honestly, just search for it on my channel. You will find it. Because a lot of the videos I've made over the years are designed to help people take care of older cats, understand what older cats need, and teach people skills required to give cats medication and monitor them. I'll be referencing those, but I won't be repeating myself too, too much. I really hope that watching this video will give you the knowledge and confidence required to get similar fantastic clinical outcomes in your pet as they age and develop health issues. Because even though Mr. Pyatt is a cat and I'm gonna be talking about cat diseases, really the general approach is the same regardless of whether you have a cat, a dog, a rabbit, or an iguana in your life. I'm gonna break this video down into three sections. One, talking specifically about Mr. Pirate and what I'm doing to manage him and how he's doing. I'm also going to discuss uh, the monitoring tools I use to pr assess his progress because the most important thing we need to know about performance is that if you don't measure outcomes, you will never improve them. So assessment and measurement is an absolutely essential part of any kind of complex ongoing medical treatment. And then I'll talk about some practical lessons that I've learned, having to take care of a little sick cat at home. This might be a good time to go check out the Mr. Pirate Health Update video that I published a year ago, just so you get up to speed on him. But the quick summary is that Mr. P has been living with inflammatory bowel disease for like a decade, and I've been managing it with diet. He's also had recurring urinary tract infections for a large part of his life. And because of pandemic-related food shortages, the diet that I was using to manage him wasn't available for a while. So by the time I figured out another food that works for him, he's managed to get severe diarrhea, which led to a UTI, which led to a kidney infection, which led to another crisis, another crisis. And the end of that, he ended up developing hyperthyroidism, which he was kind of trending towards anyways chronic renal insufficiency, which he was kind of trending towards anyways. And he also had a brief bout of pancreatitis. And also around this time, he developed hind limb weakness from just a neuro neurodegenerative issue, which then had a knock-on effect of making him walk on his front legs, put more weight on his front legs than on his hind legs, which of course led to an exacerbation of his elbow arthritis. And all of these things are really, really common in older cats. And you can see how once one thing goes wrong, it tends to have a knock-on effect that makes your health kind of spiral out of control. And this is the way it always works. This is the way it works in human medicine. This is the way it works in veterinary medicine. And best outcomes are achieved when you can catch and treat all of these problems early so you can keep your patient out of entering what is basically a death spiral as you have these knock-on effects for multiple health conditions. And it's important to note that while hyperthyroidism, chronic renal insufficiency, and inflammatory bowel disease are three of the most common age-related uh, health conditions in the cat. And in fact, I have videos on all of them that you might want to check out um, that deal with them specifically and in depth. It is incredibly rare to see all three in one cat. Now I could say, oh, it's hard being a vet. We, our pets always get all the weird stuff, but that is not correct. 
In reality, any one of these conditions could have easily ended Mr. Pirate's life years ago. He's about 20 now. And for a 20-year-old cat, he's actually looking really, really good. And I think the reason that he's alive with all of these multiple health conditions concurrently is because he has a personal physician who takes meticulous care of him. Once we got him past his little crisis, he still had hyperthyroidism, chronic renal insufficiency, inflammatory bowel disease, sore elbows, and weak hind legs. Oh yes, buddy, yes you do. But the main thing is he doesn't really know it. And that's kind of the goal in veterinary practice, is to prevent animal suffering, which means to treat our patients so that they, even though they're sick, they don't know it, so that their quality of life stays good. And his quality of life is about as good as it ever was. Sure, he can't jump as high as he used to, and he doesn't play as much as he did when he was a kitten, but he feels good, and any issues that do come up are easily managed with appropriate medication. That's treatment for, for his hyperthyroidism. His renal disease is managed with the three pillars of renal disease management, diet, calcitriol, and subcutaneous fluids. So I give him calcitriol every three days when I can get it. Again, because of the pandemic, we're having a lot of drug shortages and calcitriol is one of those drugs that's really difficult to get. Uh, your vet may have trouble sourcing it. We do have to phone around a number of compounding pharmacies on a regular basis to get calcitriol made up into 60 nanogram capsules. Uh, which is kind of the dose that's appropriate for most cats. So you, you know, if your cat's really big or really small, and you might need to be fine-tuned a bit, but it's definitely a bit of a hassle getting that drug right now, but it can be sourced uh, if you have a really persistent uh, team member who will phone all the compounding pharmacies and the human compounding pharmacies and track the bloody thing down. Uh, I'm giving pirate fluids pretty much every other day, um, and I'm using this really awesome uh, fluid administration system that really speeds up how fast fluids are given. And I've been making a, meaning to make a video demonstrating this like for years and it's just life and other things have just swept me away from that. Uh, but you can see in this little clip how what it looks like is basically a pressure cuff around an uh, IV bag and those fluids are given subcutaneously to the cat. You know, again, I have a video demonstrating how to give subcutaneous fluids to a cat. It just makes them go a lot faster. And while it's important to be fairly precise with how much fluids you give, because if you give too much, you can push a patient into heart failure. If you have a cat with no heart conditions, you, you, there's room for uh, margins for error, particularly as they do lose a lot of fluids with chronic kidney disease. Again, if you have a cat with heart issues, you should really give a very precise amount of fluids based on your veterinarian's prescription. Uh, but with Mr. Pyard, because I've been doing this every other day for like a year, I kind of just kind of feel the size of his lump and I can kind of calibrate when he's got his roughly 250 to 300 mils, which is kind of my target. And then afterwards, you know, I'll deflate the cuff, I'll pull the bag out, I'll look at it, and I usually get it pretty close to right. Of course, keeping a cat with kidney disease hydrated is super important. And again, I do talk about this really in depth in my chronic um, kidney disease and cats video, which, you know, if you have a cat with chronic kidney issues, you absolutely must check that video out. Again, link will be in the description below. Uh, assuming I haven't forgotten it. And while I do recommend that people follow their veterinarian's instructions precisely, um, what I can say that for an average cat, you know, four to five kilos, 250 to 300 mils every other day seems to work pretty well. Um, that's what I use in many, many of my patients. And, and again, most people have no problem giving their cats subcutaneous fluids. Again, you can certainly check out the video on that, as I mentioned. I also have a video on my channel about how to assess how hydrated your cat is, because sometimes there is room for latitude. You know, some days I look at Pirate and I'm like, oh, you're really well hydrated. Maybe I'll skip fluids today, you know, give your skin a little break, give myself a little break, and do fluids, you know, do a three-day interval for fluids. Now, I also have a video on that on my channel called How Much Subcutaneous Fluid Should I Give to My Cat? And in it, I go over the three S's, you know, skin turger, scruffiness and stools. And again, I encourage you to look at that video because those are the guidelines that I use to determine whether I can skip a fluid day for Mr. Pirate. And honestly, I usually do it every other day. Um, I might skip like a day on that schedule, maybe once or twice a month. So not too often, but sometimes I just look at him, he looks really well hydrated and I go, well, you know, I'll give you fluids tomorrow. And that seems to work out okay most of the time. When it doesn't work out, he throws up and uh, poops on the floor. So I know very clearly where I waited too long to give him fluids, but mostly we stick pretty close to every other day schedule. And of course, Pirate is an absolute dream to work with. He's the sweetest little guy. So he's so pleasant and easy to give fluids to. I really have no excuse to skip them, except when he tells me, with his body tells me, that 
you know, he's okay for fluids for now. Then dietary management is also an issue in this little guy because renal diets, so foods specifically designed to support kidneys, are a hugely valuable intervention in cats with kidney disease. But of course, Mr. Pirate has food-responsive inflammatory bowel disease, meaning I can only feed him certain dietary proteins. And again, there's a video on IBD that you can check out if that's a part of your pet's life. And so I can't feed him the on-the-market renal diets. What I did was I asked my staff, and you can ask your veterinarian to ask their staff, to reach out to the major clinical pet nutrition companies, and all of them offer consultations, nutritional consultations for free to veterinarians. And you can ask them to reach out and just ask, given that this patient's history and lab work, what is the optimal diet for them? So based on that nutritionist consultation, I was able to find a food that has restricted phosphorus and moderate protein levels and a protein that his body doesn't react to. In his case, um, it's from a company called Rain Clinical Nutrition. I'm feeling, feeding him the pork RSS diet, which seems to be working quite well. And it is pretty much the closest food that can get to a renal diet that his body will tolerate. So, you know, you do the best you can in these kind of situations. And it's relatively low in phosphorus. You know, if he had proteinuria, it might not work, but luckily he does not have proteinuria. It's working for us really well and it's giving him really nice bowel movements. So very, very pleased with that. And of course, I'm adding aluminum hydroxide to that food, which is a phosphate binder to lower the phosphorus levels in it, to get him a little bit closer to what would be achieved in a, in a clinical renal diet. Although it's important to note that aluminum hydroxide is really not a replacement for clinical, uh, it's not the equivalent, it's not as good as, feeding our proper renal diet. So it's, a, it's something you do um, either when your phosphorus is really high despite um, feeding a renal diet or when you simply cannot feed a renal diet because a cat won't accept it or, or there's competing health concerns. And of course, phosphorus is really important because it's one of the biggest predictors of survival in kidney patients. So if you have a patient with renal disease, like chronic renal insufficiency in the cat, if you can get their phosphorus down, they'll live a long time. Once their phosphorus is elevated, that is a big red flag. So it's always a major treatment target for me to get a kidney patient's phosphorus as much under control and as low as possible. So that is the chronic medications this little dude is on. And then of course, uh, he still has a predisposition to urinary tract infections. So I keep a really close eye on them. I monitor his urine closely. I'll talk about that in a little bit in the next section. Uh, and I treat them aggressively. So anytime he gets even suspicion of UTI, this little dude bro gets at least two to three weeks of an appropriate antibiotic, uh, preferably chosen by a urine culture. Uh, and so I've been really on top of treating his UTIs because anytime a kidney cat gets UTIs and they are very predisposed to them, well, I'd say cats with kidney disease, cats with hyperthyroidism, they're both quite predisposed to urinary tract infections. When they get them, it makes them crash. It, again, in my chronic kidney disease video, I talk about these uremic crises these cats get, which is when they get dehydrated and then they stop eating and they get more dehydrated and then they, all their blood values go, go to hell. Um, and then they just fall apart. And then that's when they might end up in hospital in IV fluids. That's when they must, might sustain additional kidney damage that's going to make their long-term prognosis worse. So it's really, really important to keep your cat out of a uremic crisis. I mean, just to give you guys some frame of reference, when I took over my practice, you know, 13 years ago, we used to hospitalize a cat almost every week that was in a uremic crisis. So a kidney cat, you know, comes in not eating and vomiting two to three days in the hospital, Typically they can go home, sometimes they don't, you know, depending on how, how sick they are and owner finances and a bunch of other considerations. Um, these days, I'll often go for like a year, maybe hospitalizing one cat, and I have a higher proportion of old cats in my practice now. What this means is I got really, really good at helping people manage these cats at home, which keeps them out of the uremic crisis, which keeps them at home and healthy, out of the hospital and living longer. My little senior citizen can't tolerate recording too, too long. So this video did get shot in a couple sessions and Claudia is here to uh, raise a ruckus and get in the way as always. Yes, aren't you darling? Yes, you are. So where were we? Yeah, so I just talked to you about all the treatments for old geriatric cats. And um, let's not forget, the most important treatment we can have for them is love and attention. You gotta pay attention to these guys because that's how you notice when things go wrong and you gotta spend time with them. You know, if Pyre doesn't jump up on the bed or the couch because his little legs are sore, well, you know what? I come down to his level 
and I spend time with him on the floor. I come pet him when he's in his basket where he likes to spend a lot of time. So, you know, your relationship with your cat might change as they age and develop health conditions, but it doesn't have to get any less close or fun because, you know, he'll sit in his basket and still bat at a cat toy um, very happily, just he might not run after it, right? Oh, before I forget, arthritis. So arthritis is something that often gets forgotten about in cats for two reasons. One is cats can be quite subtle about it. In Pirate's case, it's really his limp is really obvious, but often cat arthritis, um, which is most commonly present in the neck and elbows, can be quite hard to diagnose and pick up even for owners. Part of it is just that it gets kind of lost in the shuffle because it's not a life-threatening issue, but it can be something that really decreases your quality of life. Usually arthritis is managed with painkillers, so I tried that for Pirate, but I find I, could, I had a hard time getting the right dose for him because that's kind of mean, I don't want him to be sleeping all day, right? Um, and he was getting kind of a little bit sedate with pain control, but luckily we have this really awesome new drug on the market called Solenzia, uh, specifically for feline arthritis. Oh God, Claudia, you are such a little jerk. <laughs> she loves doing this. She'll just sit on pirate when he's in a basket. Look at his little cat jerk. Yeah. Okay, well, she's grooming him now, so maybe that's to make up for it a little bit. So, as I was saying, Solenzia, really cool drug. It's a monoclonal antibody that you inject into the cat, and it binds pain receptors in her joints. So it basically takes away arthritis pain, and it's like one injection a month. So that's a really cool new development. Just came into the market in Canada, I think, like five, six months ago. So I've been giving him Solenzia injections, and this is not our... You know, I'm not advertising Salenzia here, but I, I think I see a significant improvement in his comfort and he certainly walks better. So I've been doing it about once a month. Um, you know, also, you know, when he vomits, I give him a little bit more laxative. I give him Serenia, which is a really great anti-nausea medication and also has mild pain control effects. So it's really nice um, for managing low-grade arthritis pain in an older cat. So you know, the, it's, it's one important thing not to forget to like offer some level of pain control, even though, again, arthritis might not be a critical issue to these cats. It is something where if you can manage it successfully, it improves their quality of life. And of course, we want to give them the best quality of life possible, right? Let's talk about monitoring. And this is a sticking point because Let's face it, as a veterinarian, you spend a lot of your career dealing with rejection. You know how to help your patients, but often clients either don't have the money or aren't willing to spend the money or just aren't willing to do the work required. Um, and this is an area where educating people can really, really improve compliance and really help people understand the value of what they're doing and they're much more willing to do it which is a big reason of why I make these videos and the big reason of why I spend about an hour every, with each client that comes to see me or close to it, if they need it. Monitoring is one of those things that people sometimes struggle to see the value of it. And so it's most veterinarians tend to not offer really the best monitoring they can to their patients. And I'm as guilty of this as any other vet, because frankly speaking, it, it is really, depressing when people keep saying no to you and, and often accusing you of like trying to steal their lucky charms instead of helping them. And at some point you just give up and you stop offering things. And you know, there's also no really clear cut guidelines. You know, people say, oh, a catch with chronic health issues should have a health check twice a year, not once a year. Well, that's great, but you know what? Some patients need to be seen every month. Some patients are fine to be seen once a year. It really varies between them. Throughout my career, the only way that I found to really figure out what a patient needs is to actually do the work, to monitor them, to, to do little check-ins. Say, okay, we'll recheck in a week. Oh, we're going good. Let's recheck in two weeks. Still good? Let's recheck in a month. All right, we'll see you in three to four months. That kind of approach tends to dial in kind of an appropriate monitoring schedule for a patient. But you know what? It might require weekly check-ins for a little while if you keep finding things that are wrong. The value there is you're finding things that are wrong and fixing them, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna share with you guys Pirate's blood work. So I've been doing blood work pretty frequently on him. I'm not sticking to any hard schedule with him because he's my little dude. A lot of times vets will say, oh, come back in a week, two weeks, a month, three months. Just for scheduling purposes. When I do it to my clients, I always say, come back in three months, or if you see a change that you think is for the worse. So in Pirate's case, you guys can see his blood work. The values we're looking at, this is a pretty typical lab test. SDMA, creatinine, and urea are the three things that are typically used to diagnose kidney disease. And you can see that then when the numbers are red, they're out of normal range. When they're black, they're normal. This is Mr. Pirate's blood work over the last um, I guess two years. And you can see his numbers are 
in the red, in the red, which is, you know, he's got chronic kidney insufficiency. You never see those numbers go to normal, usually, when a cat has chronic renal insufficiency. But you see on some of those blood tests, those numbers are normal. And in fact, as we go on in time from 2021 to 2023, those numbers tend to get more normal. Why is that? Well, it's because his doctor, Dr. Yuri Burstyn, is getting better at managing kidney disease, and his owner, Yuri, is getting more consistent and more um, dialed in about giving him fluids and his medications. I cannot tell you how freaking amazing these results are in a cat that's 20 years old and has had kidney insufficiency for multiple years. It is hard to overstate how incredibly rare it is to see you know, those values go down and even dip into normal ranges once they've been up for multiple years. Uh, and again, most of this is just really dialing in those sub fluids, dialing in the diet. Um, you can see his phosphorus numbers a bit down aren't fantastic. You know, back in 21, he was at 1.3, 1.4. The last couple times he was up at 1.8. I actually mean to retest that re um, sometime in the next week or two because I've added, started adding more uh, aluminum hydroxide. That is because he's not getting a proper renal diet because he can't accept it. His body won't tolerate it. If he was getting a proper renal diet, I think those phosphorus numbers would be better, but they're still pretty good. Ideally, I'd like them to see below 1.6, but I'll take 1.8 any day over two. And certainly, as long as they're not in the red, we don't have a negative prognostic indication in play. These lab tests are fantastic. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of false modesty. This is genius work here. And it's because, look, but look how often the blood work has been done. If you look at the dates, June, September, October, then a little break down to January. Oh, two blood tests in January. February, there's probably urinalysis in there because suspected a UTI. You see what's happening here is you have pretty diligent monitoring. And we're not doing this every week because, you know, there's definitely a financial cost to doing a blood test. There's also like time cost, time and effort for you to bring the patient in. There's a stress cost for the patient. You know, blood work isn't a big deal, but it's probably not the nicest part of the cat's day. So you don't necessarily want to poke them, you know, three times a week for no good reason. But to give you guys a frame of reference, a human getting this kind of management would probably getting blood tests done weekly for like years. So what we do in veterinary medicine, even done at a level like this, which is probably way above what I've ever done for a client, because I'm just, most clients won't tolerate it for one re reason or another. Um, it's still way below sort of optimal what would be done in a human where, um, you know, outcome is the only thing that matters. But I'm incredibly proud of this blood work. And honestly, my heart bleeds a little bit every time I, I wait for the latest results to load. Because obviously, um, you know, I want my little friend to do as well as he can. And, um, but it is, so it is a stressful, stressful event to take him to do blood test on him. But, you know, I've given him a little break since February. Um, this video is being recorded in April, so he's probably due for one. I don't, probably don't want to go more than three months in him without checking in to see how he's doing. But there's another really important monitoring parameter that doesn't cost any money, but is probably just as important, and that's his body weight. So if you look at his body weights here, look how stable his body weight is. Last week, I treated a cat only with chronic kidney disease. So a third, if not a quarter, of Pirate's health problems. Uh, also 17 years old, so like three years younger, that cat weighed 2.1 kilos. This cat used to weigh 5.5. So needless to say, this cat was skeletal, not eating, you know, in a uremic crisis. Eh, we got him eating within 24 hours. That's just, you know, it costs the owner some money, it costs a bit of effort. You know, that's what happens when you have a crack medical team on the case. But definitely that cat will hopefully be with us for a few more years. But his quality of life and his outcome are definitely worse than if he was brought in back when he was five kilos. So body weight monitoring is incredibly important. It's something I encourage everybody to do when they have an older pet because you'll notice drops in body weight long before you notice a cat obviously acting sick. You know, It's not uncommon for uh, a cat to come into the vet, owner saying, oh, he hasn't eaten for a few days. Looks like he's lost some weight. And you weigh him and they've lost like 50% of their body weight. And it's like, not a subtle change, right? Ideally, you would have caught this when they lost 5% of the body weight. But, you know, at home, you see your cat every day. You might not notice small incremental changes, or you might just get used to the way they look over time. But objective mod body weight monitoring, so putting them on an actual scale regularly, will help you pick up these changes. And certainly, if you have a steady downward trend in a cat in their body weight that's not explained by something obvious, like a change in their food or diet, uh, that is a huge red flag. You're going to want to have that checked out. Blood work and urinalysis immediately, and then you can figure out whatever the underlying cause is, treat it, and you have an amazing outcome with minimal cost because 
you know, doing 10 blood tests like this over the course of two years is way cheaper than one weekend spent in an emergency clinic when your cat crashes. And of course, produces a far better outcome, both in terms of quality of life and your cat's longevity. So you save money and make cats' lives better with close monitoring. And if there's one lesson I would love people to take away from this video, it's that there's a substantial and awesome payoff to keeping a close eye on your cat's blood work, on their body weight, you know, on their urinalysis. Because the reason Mr. Pyard is a 20-year-old cat who's maintaining his body weight pretty close to what he's been his whole life and living a relatively good life despite having a ton of health issues is because it's mostly because of close monitoring and all the medication and all the treatments we do is based on sound monitoring protocols speaking of which anytime this little dude's urine smells worse than usual or i see him pee like i see a litter box uh, getting used more normal immediate urine culture so again this is like <laughs> you know, all, for all of you Harry Potter fans out there, eternal vigilance. You must keep an eye on that urine. And the moment you suspect a urinary tract infection, get this cat, get the urine sample, get the cat on antibiotics, because UTIs are often asymptomatic. You can run a UTI for six months, and it'll be really hard to tell unless you do a urine sample or you just notice that the cat's urine smells worse than usual, which, let's face it, you know, you probably don't want to sniff your cat's urine on a regular basis. Uh, but often they don't really get sick until it moves up to their kidneys and then you have a kidney infection called pyelonephritis, which is way worse than having a UTI. So ideally you catch it at the UTI stage and then you treat it, you know, treat it at home, a couple of weeks of oral antibiotics, not seven days. Um, some vets do seven days because that's the AHA recommendation. But that's for uncomplicated UTIs. If you have chronic kidney disease or you're a geriatric patient, your UTIs are never uncomplicated. Complicated UTI, treat for two to three weeks. Uh, and then retest the urine three to five days after you finish treating to make sure you've cleared the infection. Trust me, this produces a far superior outcome to throwing a week of antibiotics at these patients and then not looking at their urine afterwards. That will mess up a certain percentage of these cases. You'll have either failure to treat, recurring UTIs, other issues you just miss. Uh, until your cat comes down with a kidney infection three months later and you're like kicking yourself because you didn't treat the simple UTI when you could have. So yeah, monitoring, super important. And again, I know this is a big, probably the biggest sticking point uh, for pay, getting high quality care to veterinary patients is just convincing clients to bring them in regularly, get blood work and your analysis done proactively. But you know, it is just so worthwhile and so essential to getting really good outcomes. And this is something even like specialist centers really fail in this. Because you know what happens? Is people go to their vet, the cat is like in a uremic crisis, it's super sick. You get referred to a specialist center to their internal medicine service. They hospitalize the patient for a week, charge you $20,000. Great, you get your cat back. They're stable. But they're, if there's no follow-up, if they don't tell you to come back, they tell you to go to your family vet, your family vet is like, all right, you're doing good, come back in six months, then that's 20 grand down the sink because your cat just gonna end up in a uremic crisis again. Uh, what you really need to do after an event like that is close monitoring. Check their blood work in a week, in two weeks, in a month. Make sure it's stable to getting better, not getting worse, because they're still gonna be fragile from that event. And then when you can stabilize them, then the owner and the cat get a little break, a couple of months at home with no, no vet visits, right? I think I said this before, but monitoring, monitoring, monitoring is just so damn important. Just doing blood work and urinalysis alone isn't enough. You need a good brain to interpret them. And this is where having, uh, you know, investing the time in, in building a relationship with a veterinarian who really um, gives you value for your tests, who spends time with you to explain things, who counsels you, supports you. You know, 70% of people pick the veterinarian by proximity to their house, which is probably the worst possible way to pick a doctor. So invest the time and money to find a vet who will invest the time in you and your patient and your case. And in the long term, it'll be worth the extra 15 minute drive. I wanna close this video by talking a little bit about the practical lessons I've learned um, just from living and taking care of my own little friend with health conditions. Because you know what? You can learn as much as you want as a doctor. And I've learned a little bit as from a doctor perspective, but there's certainly certain things that you just can't dial in unless you have to deal with a health issue every single day of your life. And uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, you know, we're not gonna, not every veterinarian is gonna have every disease in their own pets, for, <laughs> at least we can hope. But there's certainly some things we can learn. There's quite a few practical little things that we've done around the house 
to make Mr. Pirate's life comfortable and make taking care of him easier. You know, setting calendar reminders on my phone for when he needs his calcitriol and fluids has been a huge help. I still miss doses occasionally, you know. No one's perfect, but I miss a lot fewer doses. Yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. I occasionally miss a dose. You probably don't mind. But, you know, the fewer doses and fewer treatments you miss, the better the benefit to your patient. I have a video on how to give a cat a back massage that came out of trying to help Pirate with his arthritis issues. So doing like massages, offering little hot packs, do check out that video, it's super cute. Um, that kind of thing is, you know, you don't develop, you don't work that out until you actually live with a cat who needs it. But, you know, just doing a massage like improves his mobility for the whole day. If I spend like five minutes just basically just petting him correctly or, you know, massaging his back in the morning, he walks better all day long. He does more trips to his food dish, more trips to the water dish. And it often, you know, you crises are, precipitated by a patient getting dehydrated because they just they eat a little bit less, they drink a little bit less, and you just have kind of this like spiraling knock-on effect that might accumulate over days to weeks, but eventually causes some you know serious problems. I want to give a huge shout out to the amazing Sim, my wife, who figured out this next trick, which is to position the water dishes in a place that's convenient for the cat. Mind blown, right? Sounds pretty simple, but uh, we have a water dish that Sim got, a little elevated water dish, put it right next to Pirate's bed, and we actually see him laying there like a lazy little pork chop that he is, uh, and just drinking out of the water dish without even getting up. And I've noticed that I feel like the, his hydration's noticeably improved to my best ability to assess his hydration. And I've actually noticed I can get away with giving like maybe one or two sub-Q fluid day a month less, because he's drinking more because he doesn't have to get up anymore. And you know, getting up for him is kind of hard and he's a lazy little cat. Uh, so we, we've got like five or six water dishes, you know. He's got a chair that he likes to hang out in and look out the window. So we put a little water dish on the windowsill. We got a water dish right next to his bed. We have another water dish right next to his uh, food. We have a little water fountain in the living room. So he's never really more than five or six steps away and he drinks from all of them. And again, this is, you know, it's a small incremental change, but it is a really valuable one. And you know, anything we can do to keep these cats hydrated will keep these cats feeling good and out of the hospital. So it's really worth doing. Dental health is another one. You know, I clean cats' teeth when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. I'll put them under anesthetic. I'll clean their teeth. Because we know that patients with good oral health are also have better kidney and heart health. So keeping up with dental care for your older cat don't be afraid of those anesthetics. The benefit or the risk of the anesthetic, and there's always some risk to anesthetic, when done well, should be outweighed by the incredible benefits. And again, your vet should be comfortable administering a high-risk anesthetic. If they're not, they can bring in a traveling anesthetist to oversee it. Might cost a couple hundred bucks more, but now c'est la vie. But yeah, good oral care is really important to their health. I'm sure that a part of the reason my little dude is doing so well is because he doesn't have a rotting mouth full of bacteria that's going to throw septic emboli throughout his system and cause inflammation that, that the rest of his body has to deal with. Another thing that I discovered that is super important is finding a good cat sitter. Because you know what? You may want to travel. And when you travel, you can't let the 12-year-old down the road take care of your 20-year-old cat with multiple health conditions. Uh, you can't go away for three days with a dish full of food like many of us like to do. Uh, you might get away with it with a younger cat, though you probably shouldn't. But with an older, when you have an older cat in your life, you need to get a cat sitter who's comfortable doing all of the treatments that they need to have done and who's reliable enough to do them to make sure the food in the litter box is top top, who will be able to take them to the vet if they have a crisis when you're not around. Uh, in my practice, we have a couple of former veterinary nurses who have moved on to other things, who basically as a sideline will come to people's houses and cat sit medical cases. Some hospitals offer medical boarding for high-risk patients. So have a plan in place for what your cat's gonna, or how your cat's gonna be taken care of during vacations. That is super important and that's something people don't think about early enough. Ideally, having somebody come to your house twice a day who has a veterinary nursing background would probably be perfect, uh, but definitely have a plan ahead of time for what happens when you travel. And if you are gonna be like out of the town, out of country, make sure that your cat sitter is okay with taking your cat to the veterinarian if they have a crisis. Make sure you have a credit card on file with your vets so they can offer any treatments necessary without trying to get a hold of you, particularly if you're in a different time zone. So think a little bit ahead about travel because you really want to make sure that your little friend is taken care of. You know, I've had people fly back from like across the country when their cat's in a crisis and sometimes that can't be avoided. 
Other times it could be avoided with just a little bit of forethought and planning. So do plan ahead to make sure somebody who's competent and reliable to take care of your cat when they travel and make sure that your veterinarian um, has the authorization to treat and your credit card on file so they can be paid for their work. That way, uh, if anything happens when you're not around, your little friend is taken care of the same as if you were around, or at least until you can be contacted and, and things can be sorted out. Again, I'm gonna remind you of that video about geriatric cat care, you know, setting up comfortable cat beds and electric blankets, heating, all of that stuff makes these cats' lives a little bit better. And the last thing that I'm gonna remind all of you to do is to focus on the positives. Yeah, you know, our little friends, when they get older, they get sick, it is hard on us emotionally. We worry about them. You know, we know that at some point we're going to need to say goodbye to them. And that's the horrible thing to contemplate. But it's really important not to fixate on it. Focus on the positives. Take it one day at a time. Just focus on the joy that the animals in our lives give us. And don't stress about the day that you have to say goodbye to them. That day will come. And it's just a part of having animals in our lives who don't live as long as us. But I feel like it's really important. I try, you know, as much as I talk about mortality, morbidity, clinical outcomes, at the end of the day, I also feel it's really important to remember that you never know what tomorrow will bring. So don't stress about anything. Just focus on the good stuff. Focus on the cat love. Focus on all the joy you get. And just, you know, the inevitable will come, but we will um, we'll delay it as far as possible. And as, you know, I think... <laughs> I think we can all say, you know, death comes for all of us, but not today. Right, Pirate? Not today. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this always has proved to be helpful, entertaining, and useful, and makes your life and your little friends' lives better. Until next time, don't forget to have fun with your cats.